Hello there, I'm Justin. Uh, I'm going to talk you through a time-lapse video of a painting I recently finished. Um, a little caveat before we start, um, this process is not uh, a process I would use for commercial illustration. Uh, that is to say, like, I'm sure that, like, I, I hope there's helpful things that uh, will help you guys, you know, with painting and things like that, but this isn't how, if I got a brief for an illustration job or a concept job, this is not how I would start. Um, it's extremely spontaneous. The one thing that I didn't include was the, like, hour worth of hemming and hawing I did before I started trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And pretty much we start right as I was like, okay, whatever, I'm just going to throw a sky gradient down. Um, so, you know, this is a, it's a, this is a very organic um, time lapse. So let's get started. Um, I like sunsets a lot, so a sky gradient was instantly going to be like a, you know, late time of day, late afternoon, uh, kind of green with some, some warm colors coming up from the ground. Um, and then, you know, the kind of instant dark to light layering of, of planes in the atmosphere. So like foreground, middle ground, background, um, with kind of like a shadowed sky color, uh, value to them with the knowledge that the sun's going to kick a, like a kind of bright orange highlight on the side. Yeah, there, right there. Um, you know, I kind of, I, I knew this time of day would, would have that there from the beginning. And I knew that would help bring the forms out. So, you know, that's kind of, I started, started with that in mind. It wasn't something that really developed later, um, which is actually pretty important. Like a lot of, a lot of the decisions that you see me make quickly, uh, there are probably a lot of things going on in my head down the line that I know like, okay, I'll fix this later, or this will be augmented later to make, make more sense. Um, trying to find the right color, right, right shape for that highlight. Like, where's the sun? Is it, is it behind, more behind the mountain or more ahead of it? Uh, you saw I put all the, the trees on uh, their own layer, uh, clipping mask on top of the mountain silhouette, just to make it easier to organize. Um, you'll see I'll do that with the character as well and a lot of other like rocks and vegetation. Uh, keeping them on their own discrete layers is really good for separating value groups and um, material groups. Um, I realized that the mountain was pretty centered in the composition, and so I kind of wanted it to be more of like a, just a background piece and not a focal point. So I decided to you know make a foreground to put um, some characters on to keep the viewer's eye active or to, to act as the focal point instead of the mountain. You see there's a lot of shape searching in there. Um, a lot of trying to, to discover what I really wanted to, wanted to do. Um, that's pretty common even even in commercial work, but it's especially like, uh, you know, a, lot, a piece like this would normally have hours and hours and hours of, of pre-planning. Um, and I don't really have uh, that going for me with this. And so a lot of the time is spent kind of redrawing things over and over and over, uh, like this character. Um, you'll see I'll go through like several different, uh, you know, probably five or six different iterations of similar characters trying to find the right tone, the right, um, you know, like where should they be looking? What should their pose be? You know, what's their, what's their backstory? Um, How can I, I don't know, just trying to make this more than just a landscape, like to give the landscape some meaning. Um, this is actually probably much more akin to what I would usually do. Uh, this kind of laying laying things out in an underdrawing uh, and then putting that on a, you know, lowering the opacity of that and uh, refining it with, with a darker line on top, essentially like penciling and inking like you would a comic book. There's a lot of like, you'll see me duplicating the layers to keep the things that I like and then uh, erasing out certain parts to try to fix them. And even even as I go, like you'll see I'll, I'll probably land on on a, one of the first ones that I did, one of the first drawings that I did, but 
at the time I wasn't really feeling super good about it and I was just trying a bunch of other things to try and find the one that felt right. Um, a lot of this too is uh, trying to drive towards like, you know, it's, it's kind of a speed painting approach and a lot of the goal is to get as close to a final product as possible, um, as early as possible, because that determines a lot of the decisions that you make about value, tone, like what kind of atmosphere you want, um, especially like in this case, well, we'll, you have a character like deciding what should their attitude be, how should they be dealing with things. Uh, it's, um, I know it's, uh, it's kind of part of the process with anything. Like design is all about driving towards the closest, um, you know, most final pro like, you know, iterating general to specific uh, to mitigate bad decisions. You'd see too where I changed her expression from being kind of like a, a happy, cheerful expression to a little bit more somber to match the tone of the piece. Trying to fix her hand. You'll notice too, like, there's a lot of things all change and they're just small changes, um, especially for any of you watching this who might be more of a beginner or novice. Uh, the better you get, the more the small things matter. Um, you know the term the devil is in the details, and it's really true. Uh, it, it seems like some people kind of complain about critiques as being nitpicky, but I think that's a very dangerous thing to say because a lot of the times nitpicking small things, small details, is actually what, you know, that you'll hear, you know, attention to detail means that you were very careful and especially when you reach a certain level, um, that care is what really separates someone, it separates the people who kind of imitate and and have a cursory knowledge of things uh, and people who really have a deep, intimate knowledge of subjects. Um, right now I'm just doing like a quick lighting pass. It's not meant to be permanent. I know that I'm gonna go back later, but it's just a quick way to establish like what are the values and colors going to be on her? Um, you know, how, how will this work? You know, should I change things? I think now I start working on the foreground a little bit. It started off really dark just to separate it from the midground, and now I'm adding in lighter tones of the skylight, um, trying to affect it. I shift the hue around just a little bit. Again, when I say like delves in the details, I'll move it like one or two degrees. Um, warmer or cooler towards or away from a color to try to get that variation. And, you know, it's not, it's not just a, it's not randomly stitched through. A lot of it is like, okay, there's a plane change happening here. That's an opportunity for me to change the temperature. And the strokes are also, you'll notice, very flat and horizontal because essentially, especially with the style of painting where I'm using very opaque brushes, as if it was gouache or uh, acrylic. Um, essentially, every stroke you make, if you imagine just two lines outlining the stroke, that's what you're actually doing. Uh, you're really, you're really drawing, in in essence. Um, so all those flat horizontal lines on the ground actually serve to you know show the form of the ground and show foreshortening, um, and kind of act as as a bit of natural perspective. Um, all the shapes, like of the leaves as well, you'll see like all the leaves were done essentially with, with one stroke, trying to capture a rhythm and a repetition. Um, they're not, the, the grass is a little bit hastily indicated, but it's not just like a leaf brush or like a, you know, a random texture brush, like, oh, there's a, a shrub here. Um, because I feel like with this style, that clarity is, is good to have. Like, even if it means fewer plants or, you know, oh, it's not, it's not necessarily like romantic. Um, but I find the cleanliness is, is very nice. You can also note how I frame the foreground with that, with the light kind of peeking through um, all the plants in the ground and stuff like that. And how that interacts with the large kind of smooth shadow behind that the mountain is casting. Um, a lot of getting depth in compositions in uh, large vista shots like this, or really even even small interior shots of intimate spaces, uh, is about 
layering light on dark very intelligently. And the more you can do that using reflection, using skylight or different materials or, you know, fog, which I'll use towards the very end, um, moisture in the air. Uh, that's really how you get depth when you have these large expanses of open air where you don't have like, for example, like a tile floor to tell you how far things are apart. Um, you really rely on the layering of light and dark. Even in the shadow, you can see um, the way the grass uh, is darker than the slope of the middle ground uh, mountain trail. A lot of that is you know, that's still light on dark, even though they're both in shadow, I'm still playing off the shapes of each and, and their values um, to reinforce that sense of depth. You'll notice too, like I, I shaped the tree line really early on, kind of pushing the eye towards the main character. Um, also just to kind of to show some of the topology of that mountain. I tend to do a lot of people and mountains, I think, because, you know, I'm in the Pacific Northwest and there's mountains uh, in every direction. So they're very nice. I think also just they're interesting because they're they're vertical and we're kind of, uh, you know, the earth is pretty flat in general. So things that stand up vertical are pretty awesome. Um, this kind of shows, like I separated each of her clothes out by material, which is really helpful now where I go on each individual layer um, using light and shadow to kind of carve out those shapes, almost like, well, literally like cell shading, um, trying to use just the simplest description to tell the most about form, like the shadows that wrap around her elbow, you know, showing both the thickness of the material, um, the softness of it, um, you know, the way it gathers, it shows the form of her arm underneath it because it's wrapping around where her bicep would be. Um, you know, in, in each individual material reacts, it's, you know, it has its own value range of dark to light and keeping that separate really helps with readability. Like if you, if you squint your eyes, which I did often, um, the goal was really to make sure that you can read it even if it's super blurry, and especially when you're doing things that are animated or in motion, uh, those value groups are extremely important to uh, helping the viewer follow what's, you know, follow the action. You'll often see these things like uh, points of contrast on the hands and feet um, for some characters more than others, which are often just so that you can track them, whether it's light or dark, you'll be able to, you know, see where the hands are because if they were if everyone wore black gloves all the time it would be pretty difficult to you know like watch a bruce lee fight scene if he's wearing black you know all black um not always necessary but you know you can use light in the same way like use light to frame fast or, or you know quickly moving things uh to make sure that they read very very strong uh, kind of change your wardrobe there a little bit um, I also, I went with the, the character, uh, or the drawing where she's making eye contact with the baby that she's holding, um, specifically because that acts, it's a eye contact between two figures in a composition is an extremely strong focal anchor. Um, this, and, you know, I kind of am leading the rest of the composition to, to pull into that, uh, with like the bright clouds in the background. Um, you know, the shapes of the mountains curving down uh, to her. But really, the, the other ones were kind of facing away, and I kind of have like a gripe about people facing away from things because it feels kind of like an excuse not to paint a face uh, when they're, well, they're fun to paint, but they're also really expressive and offer a lot of opportunity to invite the viewer in, you know, a sense of sympathy or empathy, um, or just, you know, that word relatability. Um, but I felt like if, if, if your character is looking off screen, uh, like off camera, you are intentionally throwing the viewer's eye off camera. Like you'll see, even if you're making a portfolio and you have character sketches, you want to always face them into the page, like whichever way their eyes are going, whichever, whichever way their general action is going, 
you want to lead into the page um, because it actually does uh, push people's eye out of it. That's why when you hear about composition, like it can seem very esoteric and uh, subjective. But if you really are careful to pay attention to the way your eye moves, you'll see that that kind of thing happen all the time. Uh, speaking of composition, you'll also notice like I, towards the beginning, was very careful to plant her head and the second traveler on the thirds, like the rule of thirds. I use the crop tool to kind of figure out where they were because it's easier than anything else. Um, and that's super intentional. I didn't used to pay attention to that in the past. Uh, I thought it was kind of like, oh, well, that's just a guideline, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But as I've gone on, I've realized that it's uh, it's actually a very, very effective tool that I would recommend, you know, I've cropped entire pieces before, cutting off like a half of a piece just to make it work compositionally. Also, you'll notice what I just did with the trees and the mountains in the back, the light that hits them is much darker and much more red than the light that hits the mountain or the character. Um, it's really important to know that light, A, that, that light sources have a color um, and it affects materials differently, but also that that same light color will act differently in different materials. So the, you know, giant bright mountain stone, you know, it even actually decays as the sun kind of refracts or uh, defracts or dissipates or whatever, uh, you know, it gets filtered through. And so the light starts very orange at the top and becomes very red or almost purple at the bottom. Uh, you know, if you look up like pictures of mountains at sunset, you'll see that happen a lot. Uh, thus the purple on the mountain in the background. Um, I did some color grading and I'm adding in some atmosphere just to really push that separation of, of, uh, of planes and to push kind of the sense of atmosphere and scale. Um, I used a screen layer. Screen is a really great uh, way of adding light. You have to be very subtle with it, but um, can use it to great effect. It's not as overbearing as uh, overlay layers tend to be. Um, Well, yeah, there it is. Uh, here's the final. Um, I apologize that the video recorded at a very low resolution, so it's uh, pretty blurry. That was kind of a, an accident on my part, and I'll try not to uh, let that happen again. The actual working size was about 8,000 pixels. Um, this is the actual size of, you know, the detail. So as you can see, some of, like, close up, you know, um, all right, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.